Jason Greenblatt, who spent nearly three years as President Trump's envoy to the Middle East, is publishing his memoir, In the Path of Abraham, How Donald Trump Made Peace in the Middle East and How to Stop Joe Biden from Unmaking It. Mr. Greenblatt, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Good evening from Tel Aviv. Thank you. Thank you. Can Biden unmake the peace? I think what President Biden should be doing is not falling into the traps of the past. He should be supporting our friends and ally Israel, of course, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, Bahrain, all these countries in the Iran deal, because what he's doing with the Iran deal is very, very dangerous. We are not even in the line of fire, although it's dangerous to the United States of America, but you and your neighbors are in the line of fire. He should be on the same page as all of you. He should not be negotiating through the European Union. They don't care about the region. They just care about money and doing deals with Iran. And it is steps like this and disrespecting Saudi Arabia and saying certain diplomatic things but doing things behind the scenes that in theory could endanger the accords. And certainly even if it doesn't endanger the accords, could not allow anyone to build on the accords. Uh, well, since you brought up Iran, you know, um, um, some say and many in Israel also that it was a mistake, a Trump's mistake to uh, walk away from the deal? I think it's very hard to make that accusation. I think what the deal was before President Trump ripped it up, basically kicked the can down the road. It would have told, it would have had me tell my kids or you tell your kids or anybody tell their kids, we were able to hold it off for a couple of years, maybe three, four, eight, whatever it is. But as President Herzog said, and you played this clip just before, someone has to figure out a way to stop Iran from having a nuclear weapon that it could aim at Israel and the rest of the region. And it's not just the nuclear weapon, by the way. Let's remember that Iran foments terrorism and all sorts of trouble around Israel and its neighbors, whether it's the Houthis, the Houthi terrorists, I should say, in Yemen, the Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah, all of these things are generated by Iran action, and they all do need to be addressed. They can't be hidden away anymore, and we can't pretend they don't exist. Okay, now take us please behind the scenes of uh, one of Trump's greatest achievements, no doubt about it, the Abraham Accords. How did it all start? How did you uh, manage to move it until a peace accord? And I address this in the book, um, and, and I know, for example, Barack Ravid's book is out, and I like Barack. We may think differently, politically differently. He's a great uh, reporter. But I want people to focus not on the couple of sound bites that uh, are interesting and perhaps sexy to people now that Barack managed to get from President Trump and others who seemingly are not uh, named, but rather understand that those sound bites don't make peace. Those sound bites don't make Israel policy. What I discussed in the book and what I could share with you is we spent several years, me three years, my additional colleagues, um, another extra year to build a peace plan that was both Israel-Palestinian and Israel-Arab. And the Palestinians were told, even after they disengaged with us in December of 2017, that we were going to continue working, that they could no longer have a veto card on the peace effort. President Trump was serious about peace. They could either join us and see if it could happen, or they could stand on the sidelines and see if we can make peace with the Arab countries. And I give the Trump administration tremendous credit. They were able to bring it to the finish line because the region has changed tremendously. And that's another point in the book, which is stop looking at the region as you looked at it four years ago, eight years ago, 20 years ago, the region is so dramatically different today. Learn what we learned. We spent three, four years learning this new region, speaking to the leaders, understanding their new vision, and that's how we built peace. I'm trying to understand what you know moved the wheels in this Abraham Accord deal. Uh, was it business? Was it the arms deal that was behind it? What, what was the main factor there? So I don't think you could point to any particular thing. You know, depending on who you're talking to, some would say those points, others would say uh, the suspension of what I don't like to call settlements, but cities and neighborhoods in Judea and Samaria. There are so many different things that people could point to. But what it really points to, if you look at it holistically and realistically and honestly, is that because the region has changed and wants to move forward in a completely different way, and because the region was tired of letting the Palestinians dictate their own country's needs and aspirations and, and important safety concerns, and because of Iran, and because of oil pricing, there are so many factors that went into this that ultimately we just kept building and building and building, and then at some point, with the courageous leadership 
of the leaders in the region and President Trump and everybody who worked on it, the puzzle pieces came clicking into place. And I do believe over time, there will be others who will join as well, but not if the Biden administration or any later administration or other world leaders drag this thing backwards into old policies of the past. Now, frankly, you had the toughest job, uh, the so-called deal of the century uh, or a peace to prosperity, a vision to improve the lives of the Palestinians and Israeli people. It was tough, uh, very low expectations, uh, and uh, uh, eventually you, you did not succeed in, in achieving an accord there. Uh, what, what stopped it? So here I would differ with President Trump. I know he made some comments about Bibi Netanyahu and President Abbas, and I would actually say something different. And it's true, President Abbas can portray himself as a statesman, as a father figure. I experienced that in the diplomatic meetings. In diplomatic meetings, not all is as, as it seems, right? Uh, President Abbas once kissed me on my head and wished me a Shana Tova. He can be a very warm individual. But at the same time, he needs to accept that in order for there to be any kind of peace between Israel and the Palestinians, it has to be a realistic peace. They can't use these demands that they've been using for decades, um, changing the history. So I think what needs to happen is first, the Palestinians need to get their own political house in order between the terrorist leadership in Gaza and the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. And I think they need to be able to negotiate in good faith with Israel. And I think Israel needs a government that is willing to negotiate in good faith as well. And I think our plan did put forth, even though it failed at the moment, I think our plan put forth an extremely detailed idea of what peace could look like with maps. I think as far as Bibi Netanyahu, I think he was serious about peace, but peace under certain conditions. You know, for the prime minister of Israel, whether it was Bibi Netanyahu or today Naftali Bennett, to demand uh, security uh, concerns be dealt with emphatically, strongly, face forward. That's not someone who's not serious about peace. That's someone who wants to make sure that the citizens of his country will survive. And that's probably one of the most important jobs any prime minister has. So that's how I see the difference um, in terms of what we did, what we tried to right. do, and uh, the remarks that are reported. I would say entirely different. Actually, we have a short soundbite of, of the things that uh, uh, Trump said to Barack Ravid. Let's take a listen and, and uh, comment on this. I looked at him and said, you don't want to make a deal, do you? And he said, well, uh, 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 and the fact is, I don't think Bibi ever wanted to make a deal. Why? I thought the Palestinians were impossible. And the, the Israelis would do anything to make peace and a deal. I found that not to be true. He, he says Netanyahu never wanted a deal. I don't agree with President Trump. I could see why President Trump may have said that in the meetings that he was in with the understanding. Remember, you have all these people surrounding uh, any world leader, let's say President Trump, including myself and David Friedman and Jared and others who say things to him. And you have a, and on our team, I suppose, I would also add Mike Pompeo, Nikki Haley, Vice President Pence, so many other people who were on the same page as us. But you also have plenty of other people giving the president different kind of information. So I would say that I spent three years in countless hours of meetings talking to Bibi Netanyahu. And I think that under the right circumstances, if he can ensure Israel's security and not be forced into giving things up for the state of Israel that don't, you know, the Palestinians want but don't necessarily, uh, aren't necessarily entitled to, I would say Bibi Netanyahu could have seen uh, negotiating his way to a peace agreement if he had a serious partner on the other side. But I think you'll find as the history of this unfolds, and there are many books coming out about it, including mine, you're going to see things from different people's perspectives. And, you know, the truth will be somewhere from different people's perspective. Probably. Everybody has to look at the different prisms, the different layers of this very complicated negotiation in history. Absolutely. Very complicated. Jason Greenblatt, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me.